The law of merger as IT affects estates in land. Part 1. Chapter 1. The objects and origin of merger. The object of merger is to accelerate the possession, or at least the estate in which the merger takes place. According to Blackstone, merger is described to be whenever a greater estate and a less coincide, and meet in one and the same person, without any intermediate estate, whereby the less is immediately annihilated or is said to be merged that is, sunk or destroyed in the greater. Merger is the act of law and is the annihilation of one estate in another. Its effect is to consolidate two estates, and to conform them into one estate. After merger, the only subsisting estate continues precisely of the same quantity and extent of ownership as it was before the accession of the estate which is merged. It is a fundamental rule that there cannot be any merger unless there be a remainder or reversion in which the particular estate may merge. The learning of merger has most probably resulted from the rule, nemo petis tesi dominus et tenens, or from the inconsistency in allowing a person to have two distinct estates in point of fact, while one of these estates does at least, in legal intendment, include the time of both these estates. It would be absurd for the law to admit that the same person had two distinct estates, when the time of one of them was in construction of law equal to, and involved in the time of the other. It was to this ground that the doctrine of merger was referred in Bracer Bridge's case. The line of reasoning was that a term is a time finite, and the finite of necessity ought to be merged and confounded in the infinite. The doctrine, however, was carried beyond this principle, when it was determined that one estate for life should be absorbed in another estate for life. The law assumed it to be clear that the estate in reversion or remainder would continue longer than the estate in possession, and concluded that to be certain which was only possible. When it is considered that the law of surrenders is based upon the rule that nemo petis tesi dominus et tenens, and that merger bears a close resemblance in its effect to a surrender, it may be considered with good reason that to this rule the doctrine knows its origin. Mr. Preston, however, observes, that it may be offered as a conjecture, carrying with it some semblance of probability that merger was originally introduced into our system of tenures for the purpose of deciding on the right between the heirs and executors of a deceased tenant, who was the owner of several estates, one for years, the other in fee. Under these circumstances the preference would, beyond all doubt, be given to the heirs. That they should be preferred was a necessary consequence of the dependent state of the term on the freeholder. By some writers, merger has been treated as a surrender in law, and, indeed, there is not any case in which merger will take place unless the right of making and accepting a surrender resides in the several persons between whom the transaction which causes the determination of one of these estates takes place. Though the operation of merger is in its effect as a surrender, yet in the mode of its operation merger may be distinguished from a surrender. The object and effect of a surrender are to extinguish the estate and the surrender is the identical and immediate cause of the extinguishment. While merger is merely the consequence of a rule of law, and the estate must be transferred, and therefore have some continuance in the grantee, before the union will be complete and the rule of law be applicable. Merger is sometimes absolute, sometimes conditional, and although there are some instances in which from favor to the intention the law of merger is held to be inapplicable, yet, as a rule, it operates independent of intention. The conclusion drawn by Mr. Viner from Wiscott's case is that where the inheritance comes to the particular estate, whether it is by the act of God, the law, or the party, the particular estate is drowned. However, as against one person the estate may be merged, while as against another person having a lien or encumbrance, it may have continuance in point of title. But merge it cannot accelerate a burthen as a right to a rent before it would otherwise be payable. It may, however, accelerate a remedy, or remove an impediment as in actions of waste. When several estates are limited by different deeds, or the estates commence at different times, or although they commence in point of title in the same instant of time, they are afterwards so devised that the title to one estate or interest depends on one deed or instrument, and the title to the other estate or interest depends on another deed or instrument, or if a will take effect, and a descent from the testator take place in the same instant of time, and the estate under the will, and the estate under the descent, come into the tenancy of the same person, so that one of these estates is an accession to the other at a different time, then there will be a merger. In short, 
the two estates must be the two vested estates, which are to take effect immediately after each other, without any intermediate estate. This position, however, is subject to the qualification that, if the two estates are of freehold tenure, an intermediate estate for years will not prevent their merger. As a rule, it is absolutely necessary that the latter estate should be connected with the former estate and be immediately expectant thereon, so as to come into its place on the determination of that estate. The following are the circumstances as enumerated by Mr. Preston, which must concur in order to accomplish the operation of the law of merger. First, two or more estates must meet in the same person, in the same lands, or in the same part of the same lands. Tuntly, the more remote estate must be the next vested estate in remainder or reversion, without any intervening vested estate, and also without any intervening interest by way of contingent remainder, created in the same instant of time, or by the same act which gives origin to the other estates. 3. Rodley, the estate in reversion or remainder must be as large as, or larger than, the preceding estate. Fourthly, the several estates must be held in the same legal right, or when the estates are held in different legal rights, one of them must not be an accession to the other merely by act of law. Fifthly, the estate must not be privileged either under the statute of uses or the statute of entails. Sixthly, the doctrine will not have effect to alter the quality of one of two estates in the same person or to destroy a contingent remainder, when the several estates are limited by the same deed or instrument, or take their effect in the same instant of time, and in some degree by the same act, and some other person is concerned in the consequence of the merger. Seventhly, the doctrine does not apply to an estate for several lives arising under the same limitation as giving one undivided and entire time of continuance. And, Eighthly, the union of two estates in the same person by means of the joint act of the respective owners of these estates, with an intention that the estate of their assignee should continue for the collective time of their several estates, will not be a cause of merger. It may be added that both estates must be legal or both equitable, and with reference to this point it is immaterial whether the union is produced by act of law or by act of the party. This chapter would not be complete if we were not to distinguish merger from suspension and extinguishment. Suspension is the partial absorption occasioned by the temporary union of two estates or interests, as, if a copyholder in his own right becomes saized of the manor, or of the freehold interest in the copyhold tenement in right only of another, or vice versa, the copyhold interest will be suspended during the time of such union of interests. Or if the copyholder marry the lady of a manor the copyhold will be suspended during the coverture. Again, where the Lord Tenant for life of a manor purchases the fee of a customary freehold tenement held of the same manor, the signory is suspended during the life of the Lord. Had the tenement been pure copyhold instead of customary freehold the copyhold would have been extinguished. Extinguishment is the annihilation of a collateral right or interest in the subject out of which it is derived. A rent, a common, or signory, may be extinguished, as, when a rent charge in fee and the fee itself become vested in the same person, the rent is extinguished. Or if a copyhold tenant in fee conveys his estate to the lord of the manor, the copyhold tenure is extinguished. Or as in the late case of Catley v. Arnold, where a being say eyesed in fee of twelve twenty-fourth parts of a manor held by several as tenants in common, purchased lands holden of the manor which were thereupon surrendered to a trustee for him, and afterwards to himself in fee and he was admitted tenant of the entirety by the act of all the lords. It was held that twelve twenty-fourth parts of his copyhold interest in the lands were extinguished in his freehold estate therein as lord of the manor.